You probably said that so I wouldn't switch passages again. <laughs> he locked me down. He's correct though. Uh, this isn't my normal environment. Uh, there's no blood in my fingers or my feet. And uh, I apologize for having a bottle of water up here because my body's decided to stop making spit. And so uh, I'm very nervous. But if you would, uh, let us just quick prayer. Heavenly Father, I just come before you, Lord. Um, you know my heart, Lord. I thank you for it. And praise, praise your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So the title of my message for the day is The Saints Partnership. And since you've already got your Bibles and you've turned to Philippians uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, is what we'll be going through. And I want to preface that by saying in our society, we have a lot of partnerships, a lot of associations. We have partnerships in business. We have partnerships in sports. We have partnerships in biker clubs. We have partnerships in knitting, quilting. And we have exclusive partnerships like what you would have at the country club. And they all share a common goal or an agenda. They want to make money. They want to share friendship. They want to share leisure together. But the Saints partnership is a unique partnership. There's none like it. And so uh, we want to answer a couple of questions today. And those questions are, what partnership do Paul and the Philippians share? And what's the purpose of that partnership? So let us begin our study. Let's go to Philippians. And if you can, stand for the reading of God's word. Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in every prayer for you all, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would... Open your word to us. Help us to sink in. Father God, we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So one of the difficult things about being able to preach one passage and start off with this passage is I have very little context to go with. So I have to build that into the passage and show you where Paul's coming from, what's his location, what's his situation. And... Uh, help you understand that context. So Paul is sitting actually in a prison in Rome. It's about 60 AD, and he is chained to a Praetorian guard. And the reason he's chained to a Praetorian guard is because he's been preaching the gospel. And so uh, when he says, from the first day until now, I want to try to... Uh, help you understand where Paul's coming from. And so while he's sitting there chained to the Praetorian Guard, he's reminiscing back to where he is with the Philippians 10 years ago when he met them in Philippi. And so Paul, when we get to in the end of verse uh, 5, we're actually going to kind of unpack it backwards to the front. And it says, from the first day until now. And Paul's having a, a bit of a flashback moment. He's, like I said, he's reminiscing He's reminiscing about the Philippians and how he met them. And so if you turn back, we have to define that context in Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6, it talks about Paul having a vision. And he is, he, before he has that vision, he's in Turkey. And he wants to go... He wants to go to Asia, and twice he has made the trip to try to go to Asia, and both times he's prevented by the Holy Spirit from doing so. And in that process, God gives Paul a vision from a man in Macedonia that says, come help us. 
Paul recognizes what's going on. He sees that he's been prevented from going to Asia. He sees that he's being called to Macedonia. And so he promptly, literally gets on a ship, sails from Troas to Neapolis across the Aegean Sea, goes 10 miles inland to a Roman colony of Philippi. And God immediately grants him success in the gospel. You'll find if you just keep on going down in Acts chapter 16, Paul does what Paul does. He's going out to search, to evangelize, to meet with the people. And there's no synagogue in Philippi. So he has to go outside the gate to a place of prayer. And while he's there at that place of prayer, he meets a woman named Lydia. Lydia is a seller of purple fabrics, we know. She's a worshiper of God, but not the, God of the, not the Christian God. She's a worshiper of a Jewish God. And Paul shares the gospel with her, and Lydia is converted. And then her family is converted. And then if you keep going down in Acts, you'll find out that Paul is again doing what Paul does. He's in jail. <laughs> it's kind of a theme. And so Paul being in jail, uh, he's in jail because he is trying to go out to the place of prayer again. There's a girl there with a the spirit of divination. And Paul is actually annoyed with it. She keeps kind of uh, blabbering on about Paul and Silas and the entourage that is with him. And so Paul supernaturally casts the spirit out of this, uh, this girl that has a spirit of divination. And the owners of this girl who have been... Uh, uh, manipulating her, abusing her, her spiritual gift or of divination. It wouldn't be a Christian gift and everything, but they were abusing her and using that for profit. And so when they cast the spirit out, the owners got enraged and they went to the city leaders and they had Paul and Silas thrown in jail. And while they were in jail in a most uh, peculiar situation happens, there's an earthquake. And in that earthquake, the doors flung open and the shackles fall off. And the guard, uh, the guard, you know, he fears that he's lost everybody and he's going to kill himself because of what has happened. And it's, it seems unusual, but Paul and Silas cry out and they said, don't do it. Don't kill yourself. And so the guard comes in and the first thing he asks is, what must I do to be saved? And you're thinking about that. We, we don't have any earthquakes in Ellis County, but we have a few. I can't think of a single conversion in Kansas because of an earthquake. <laughs> but it wasn't a normal earthquake because in earthquakes, doors don't fly open and shackles don't fall off. So it's a peculiar situation. And the jailer immediately realizes what's going on because the whole time Paul and Silas are in prison, they've been singing hymns and praising God. So Paul tells the jailer what he must do to be saved. And the jailer receives Christ, and the jailer accepts the gospel. So the, the question we have to ask, if we're going through our text, is what's the nature of our fellowship, or what's the nature of our partnership in the gospel? And it's all in verse 5. It says, because of your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. So Paul is, is having this, we're still in this kind of flashback moment. He's pinning the letter to the Philippians and he's pondering back to them. And he's thinking about the intimate feelings he has with them and how he longs for them and how God has brought success for them and how even the, the very beginning, he wasn't even going to go there. God has granted them a vision, and he's having all of these thoughts and all of these feelings when he says from the first day. But we have to step back into where he's at. He's in prison in Rome, chained to a Praetorian guard. And he says, until now. And when he says until now, if we had time to go through all of Philippians, you'd find out that he's referring actually to chapter 4 in verses 14 to 16. And he's talking about how the Philippians, even though it's 10 years now since he's been with them in Philippi, he's talking about how they're still partnering him in his affliction. 
that the God of the, that revealed himself to them in those 10 years ago is still with them. He's still active in their lives. He's still partnering with them. It's still not making spit. It's not. I don't think it's coming back. My tongue is like stuck to the roof of my mouth and I'm like prying it down and everything. So let's recap. Paul's in prison. He's in Rome. It's about 60 AD. He's thinking back to the Philippians. He's longing for them. He's got an affection for them. He, they're his brothers and sisters. And he is longing for them. And his affection is for them because of one thing. It says, because of your partnership in the gospel. So we have to ask a question. What's the gospel? Have you given thought to it lately? Some will say it's Jesus. Some will say it's Jesus' death. Some will say it's the cross. Some will say it's the resurrection. Some will say it's the good news. But the gospel, the gospel is that God created the world. And he put everything in it. And he put man in it. And he meant for man to dwell with him forever. And he meant for man to enjoy his presence. And he said, if you want to dwell with me, all you have to do is one thing. Just keep my perfect law. And if you keep my perfect law, we can dwell with each other forever. But man couldn't do it. And Adam sinned. Adam ate. And because Adam ate, Adam sinned. And Adam, being the father of all men, imputed that sin to us. There's none righteous. There's none that seek after God. All have turned away. Their feet are quick to shed blood. There is no fear of God. We've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And brothers and sisters, the wages of that sin is death. See, the gospel is way more than just Jesus. The gospel is way more than just Jesus' death. Although it's both of those things. It's more than just the cross. It's more than just the resurrection. It's more than just good news. There's a whole lot of bad news in the gospel. The gospel is that we need a God to save us. The gospel is that God is perfect. He is just. And that's the greatest question that the Bible has to deal with. How does a just God that's perfect in everything, that cries out for justice, redeem a sinful man to himself? That's the greatest question that we have to answer in Scripture. And the answer is God sent his son, born of a virgin, who lived a perfect life, fully human and fully God. So by one man's sin, Adam, sin entered the world. So by one man's act of justice, Jesus's, there was justification for all men. And God demonstrated that love for us, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us, the just for the unjust. He was nailed to a cross and our sin was placed on him. He died and he rose again and he was buried, I should say, too. And then he rose again. And that's the gospel. The gospel is the whole thing. We can't forget it. And so when Paul's saying, when he's pleading with them and he's looking at him, he says, for, for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, that's the affection. That's the, 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 that's the desire of his heart. It's for them to understand that. So the jailer asked the question, what must be done to be saved? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe that he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. And you will have peace with God and through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be justified by your faith. And I want to tell you a story. I like that. It's, <laughs> I even said Philippi. <laughs> I want you to to walk with me on a story. I, I have no way to, to describe what I, 
I've been thinking about it forever. I've been avoiding this moment for months. <laughs> the truth is that the blood's out of my hand and out of my feet, not because I'm scared to talk to you. I'm not scared of you guys at all. I mean, I'm with brothers and sisters and friends and family. Is how do you explain the word of God? How do I take what's in my heart and place it in yours? How do I take what's in the scriptures and how I feel and what God's teaching me? How do I give that? How do I say it? What words do I use? So I thought of an illustration. I want you to imagine with me that you're walking through Buckingham Palace. And as you're going through this tour of Buckingham Palace, you come to a door. And you open, and in that door you see there's a crown. And you walk up to that crown, and you look at it, and you see that it's, it's got jewels on it. You could tell it's the crown of the King of England. And you take that crown nonchalantly, and you grab it, and you put it on your head. What's going to happen? You're going to be arrested, and you're going to be thrown in jail. There's no way around it. But I want you to walk with me again through that same story. Imagine if you walk through that door, and you're in Buckingham Palace. It's the same thing. You see the crown. And you see its glory, and you see its weight, and you see its beauty, and you recognize its value and its importance. And you walk up to it, and you don't dare touch it. You look at it. And instead of the jailer, the guard walking in, the king walks in. And he looks at you, and he knows what you're thinking. And he says to you, a lot of people have wanted to wear my crown. They want to know what it is. And he takes that crown and he puts it on your head. And you feel its weight. And you see its beauty. You see its radiance, its splendor, its majesty. You feel its authority. It's a whole different story. Maybe another way to describe it is you, you're on the same trip and you walk in and you're going to the room and you go up and there's a curator and in her hand she has the Hope Diamond. And she, she's holding it and she would you like to hold it? Would you like to hold this diamond? It's $350 million. And she puts it in your hand and you feel it. You see it, it's cut perfectly. It's so beautiful. It's so awesome. You're gobsmacked. You don't have the words to describe the emotions you feel. I probably guess you're probably wondering what I'm trying to get at. I don't know how to describe the word privilege, but that's what I'm getting at. I'm getting at the idea that we're privileged. Philippians 129 says, for you has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but to suffer for his name. I want you to do me a favor. If you don't have your Bible in your hands, put it there. Do you see it? Do you see its worth? Do you see its authority? Do you see its majesty? Do you feel it? Do you feel the weight? Do you see the privilege of God's word? The very fact that God, have you ever contemplated it? That the God of the universe took time to make himself known to you. To you. To you. It's unbelievable to even fathom it. As soon as your mind gets a, tries to get a grip on it, it just breaks trying to rationalize it. So I want you to do a favor with me. We're going to walk back through Acts. And Paul's going outside the gate. And he's going to a woman and he's going to preach. And he meets Lydia. And Lydia's presented with the gospel. But what happens? It's in Acts uh, Chapter 16, verses uh, 13 through 15. What happens in that? She's presented with the gospel, and what does she do? 
She recognizes the privilege, the privilege to know the gospel, the privilege that God would reveal himself to you. And what does she do with that privilege? She goes and she says, Paul, come tell my family. And every one of them is converted and they're all baptized. And the same thing happens with the jailer. The jailer goes, what must I do to be saved? He's presented with the gospel and he recognizes the privilege. And he goes, Paul, Paul, come tell my family, tell my friends. And they're all converted. They're all baptized. You know, and I can't help but wonder. So I was thinking through this. If Paul, in his fondness for Lydia and for the jailer, didn't have a, it's an uncanny story. I can't help but wonder if Paul thought about his own story. You know, he's traveling down the Damascus Road. Why? To kill us. Why? To imprison us. Why? To beat us. And he's met with a God, a blinding light. And Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul recognized that he's presented with the gospel and he recognizes the privilege. And what happens? Just a few days later, he's defending us in the synagogues. They all recognize the privilege. So we said we're going to talk about a couple of questions. What's our partnership to the Paul, the Philippians, and that we share? We share a fellowship in the gospel. That's our partnership. Our partnership is the gospel. The gospel is everything to us, to our lives. It's who we are. It's our essence. It's our nature. Our nature to want to be like our creator. At least it should be. Now, Jason's going to panic for a moment. So I'm going to talk about two words. Two words that have revolutionized my thought process. So they're in verse 1. It says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be in Christ? Have you given that some thought? The idea that we're in Christ, that we're united in Christ. So we share this partnership. Paul and the Philippians share this partnership because they're united in the gospel. But we share the same partnership because we're united in the gospel. But we're united in Christ. So the same partnership that you and I share is the same partnership that a brother and a sister and I share in Afghanistan. Or some other place in the world. We all share that same partnership. And we're all united through that one belief that we're justified by Christ when we believed in the gospel. Romans 12, 5 says, So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one body. Because of the union we have in Christ, we're united with all believers. We're one body. Members of one body, but we don't all have the same role. We each have been given unique gifts and abilities. So let's go to our second question. What's the purpose of our partnership? Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, and he's writing to the church. So what is our, what is our role together as a church, as a group of believers, and how do we live out that role? What are we called to do? How are we called to live out? What makes you uniquely you? What gifts do you uniquely bring? How has he gifted that? So some of the things I was thinking about was discipleship. You know, one of the reasons we chose this church when we moved was because of the women, actually. Number one was the preaching. The word was preached every week, faithfully, fearfully. But number two was actually the women. It was a chance for my wife to be discipled by other women. 
to meet friends, to have co-laborers. That was actually the second reason. So I want you to contemplate that. One of the things the church struggles with is older men teaching younger men and older women teaching younger women. Do you have somebody you're partnering with? Do you have a woman in mind or a man in mind? Do you sit down with them? Do you talk about life with them? Do you talk about sin? Do you talk about the great things of life, marriage and babies? Do you get to know them? Do you get in the mud with them? Do you hurt with them? Do you glory with them? So there's a lot of things we can do to partnership in a church. We have evangelism, taking it out to the street, leading a Sunday school class, leading a children's school, AV team, way more difficult than it looks. Funeral services, compassion teams, nursery workers. Thank you. Maintenance and cleaning, missions, the bossies. The Alaska trip. Preaching and teaching, giving, mercy and hospitality. So what's the purpose of the saints partnership? To live out our gifts and abilities. Given in Christ for the glory of God. So how are we apply what we learned today? Recognize the partnership that you've been given, the privilege to know and to carry Christ. Live out that partnership as one body, seeking to glorify God. There's tons of scriptures about how we are to work, to seek each other, uh, to, to put others first, but not to ignore yourself at the same time. Actively pray and seek and find, understand and use the gifts that's been given to you. Now, if you're like me, what Jason doesn't know is I've been avoiding the moment for 10 years. My wife knows. I know the objection that you can have in your head. I'm no David. I'm no Ruth. I'm no Tamar. I'm no anybody. And we let that get in our brains. It's just, it's, just, it's a cancer. And the truth is, you're not. You're not a Ruth. You're not a Boaz. You're a Cassie, and a Jason, and a Sandon, and a Tom, and a Sheila, and a John, and a Dave. And the vote pads, you and Nancy and Bob. But the same privilege that was given to all those others was given to us. The privilege to know God. Amen. The privilege to have the opportunity to suffer for his sake. Do you see it? When you hold it in your hands, I hope you feel it. I hope you never look at your Bible the same. I won't. I know that. We have to be careful, too. I want to offer a few quick things we have to worry about. Sin. One of the greatest sins for me is I can go home and I can be passive. I cannot want to get in my study and spend time. I can want to avoid having to deal with something in my family or a difficult discussion. I can be dismissive of who I am in Christ who he's made me to be. Don't doubt your part in God's plan. Now, I actually never finished the sermon. Jason told me to stop writing last night at 10. <laughs> and I was up again at five. The part that I never got to write. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. I thank God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy. <laughs> joy, the greatest defense against anxiety, the greatest defense against depression, 
The greatest defense against mental illness is joy. It was given to us as a gift from God. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Joy. Where do you find it? Partnering in the gospel. Finding your role. Watching people bring you food when your wife is in the hospital because she has kidney stones. Finding the joy that we had of our brothers and sisters living out their call. Not because we seek the gift, like Paul says, but we seek the credit to your account. Let your brothers and sisters serve you. Let them know you. And it will produce joy. And it's a defense of the mind. So we've answered our two questions. What partnership do we share in the gospel? We share a partnership and a privilege to know Christ. What's the purpose of that? To live it out. To go be the hands and feet. Enjoy the presence of God and to bring him glory. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, to you be the glory. Father God, you're unbelievable, your majesty, your grandeur, the crown, Lord. The authority that you have over our lives. Lord, help us to be obedient. Help us to live it out. Lord, jar everything. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.